Let's pray. Jesus, thank you that we can just be here today. In your presence, may we not just come for what we can get out of it, but may we actually minister to your heart. Because the great commandment is to love you back. We're not very good at that. We ask you to show us how. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you pull this mic down just a touch? There's a little bit of feedback. Thank you. Psalm chapter 18 is a psalm that's going to be part of the narration in the Festival of Praise, which means that's where I'm going to start at second service. We don't have quite have the context here, but it's a rather interesting context. It starts out with verse zero. You know, there's a verse before verse one, and you'll see that a lot in the Psalms where there's instructions to the chief musician, a Psalm of David, the servant of the Lord, who spoke to the Lord. Notice, these are words not about the Lord, but are you listening? Are you reading? They're not about the Lord. They are to the Lord. By the way, worship is not about the Lord. Worship is to the Lord. Spoke to the Lord the words of this song on the day that the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. Now, I find it interesting because we have a lot of political correctness in our world today. It kind of gives you the idea that there's something wrong with David saying, Lord, slay my enemies. Is that Christian? Is that loving? Is that kind? And I think we don't have a clue what it's like to live in a world where there are people just five miles away over the hill that if they get a chance will come over and kill your children, kill your wife, kill you, take your crops, just for the whatever of it. We don't live in that kind of a world unless you're in the inner city and in a gang or something. We live in a much nicer world, don't we? You know, there isn't a whole tribe on the other side of the white tanks that every once in a while just comes over and marauds and kills and steals and plunders. We're more civilized. And so we, we think, you know, David says, the Lord, you, you slew my enemies, yes. Well, if the Lord hadn't slain them, they'd have slain him. And I don't think we understand the kind of angst that people have lived in through much of this world and still do to this day. And we get critical when they're excited that God took out the enemy. Well, if they, God hadn't taken out the enemy, the enemy would have taken them out. So we kind of got to get our equilibrium here and put ourselves in a more primitive tribal society that's much more barbaric and much more plunder-oriented and realize that people in much of this world's history have lived with much less economic and social and political security than we have. We may think things are falling apart, but we have virtual heaven compared to many people. So evidently, David, remember King Saul was out to get him, right? The king with the militia was after one guy, and David was running for his life. He had a few, a band of, of, of rebels around him who were mad at Saul too, and he wanted to kill them too. So they all banded together, and they're just hoping to survive till this king croaks. You know, that's really what they're hoping to do. Can we survive until this king just simply dies? And so, evidently, this is written after one of those times. And you can read in the, what is it, the book of uh, First and Second Samuel in there, where, you know, Saul's after David, and David's running, and David's hiding, and David's hiding in a certain city, and those people are about to turn him over to Saul so Saul doesn't bother them, so he has to run for his life again. He's hiding in a cave, you know, and God delivered him. And so he's saying, wow. I got to praise the Lord today because he saved my life. The very first few verses of that song, I will love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock 
and my fortress and my deliverer and my strength and the horn of my salvation and my stronghold. He's just adding up the Lord, how the Lord is his security. The Lord is why I'm alive. The Lord is the reason I'm still breathing. So he adds it up. He's my strength. He's my rock. Something solid, something to hang on to. You know, back then, if you could just be on top of a rock, you had a great advantage over your enemies. Right? Now they'd fly over the top and knock us off our rock, right? You know, airplanes turned this whole thing upside down. But back then, just five feet of high ground was big time. If you were on the table, you were ahead of those who were on the floor. The Lord is my rock. He's my fortress. They built a fort on the top of a hill. He's my deliverer. The Lord is my strength in whom I trust. My shield, the horn of my salvation. You know, we think of horsepower now. We think of, of velocity out of our guns. Back then, the power was in the horn of the animal, right? The animal could put the horn down. The horn was the power. If the horn gets broken, the animal is weakened. So God is the horn. He's the point. He's the thrust of my salvation, my stronghold. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. I don't think we understand in many ways the thinking or the kind of enemies that David faced and people faced. Do we face enemies though? We face enemies that have taken us out. I mean, we don't have people marauding over from the neighboring valley, but... Uh, it seems like addictions, compulsions, broken relationships, uh, we have our enemies. But it seems that we're in a society where we can handle these things. We're going to handle our addiction with groups and counseling and behavior modification. We're going to handle our relationship problems with getting the right counselor who will give us the right behavioral ideas so we can fix the problem. And you see in David here that David has been in many, many circumstances where he realized he is powerless to survive this. He's one man surrounded by 10 warriors. How is he going to survive? You know, James Bond seems to always make it through. David realized he made it through, but it wasn't him. There's no way. Later on in this psalm, and we're not going to go through this whole psalm together, but later on in this psalm, he says, death surrounded me and there was no way out. And God came in with all guns blazing lightning and earthquakes and smoke took out the enemy there's no god like my god my god is alive we are so medicalized and psychologized and behavioralized that we well, what I, I've heard people say, you know, I tried this, I tried that, I tried everything, and finally there wasn't anything to do but pray. <laughs> well, what if we'd have prayed first? Which segues, segues me to Ephesians 6. Finally, brethren, be what? Be strong in the Lord. Now, when you read that initially, it's like, okay, buck up, right? Stiffen your backbone, stand up straight, act like a man, be a strong woman. It's not what it's saying at all. Literally, the word is to be enabled. Be enabled in the Lord. The Greek word dunamis, from which we get dynamite, doesn't actually mean explosive power. It means ability to be made able or to be able to do something. Do I have what it takes? And this actually says to be in 
dunamis, enabled, inner ability. We don't need to be enabled unless we realize that we aren't abled. We don't need to be enabled unless we realize we're disabled. And here Paul says, kind of like, with what's left, that finally is to the remainder. <laughs> okay, so you're, you know, you kind of, you, you, you've done what you can and, and there's a little bit left, uh, not much left, okay, in the extremity, when all else fails, be enabled in the Lord. Interesting that verb to be enabled. In English, it looks like the state of being verb, to be, and strong, a noun. It's not, it's a verb. Be enabled. And it's in the present tense, which is ongoing. Be being enabled. Be ongoing being enabled. Not just like a shot of enablement. But it's like being plugged into the power source. You know, having the tank full of gas. Having the batteries all charged up. Being constantly enabled. It's really best of those three illustrations is being plugged into the power supply. We don't carry any of it with us. We don't have a tank to fill. We don't have a battery to fill. We only can be enabled if we are plugged in. You know, the lights up there, the sound system. It's amazing what electricity does, isn't it? I can talk really quiet and you can hear me because there's some electrons running around and they're making my voice come out over there and over there and y'all can hear me even if I talk really soft because of we're plugged in and if one little plug back there came unplugged the whole thing would go flat right the lights would go out we'd be in the dark we'd be without sound I'd have to talk really loud I don't know how people did it a couple centuries ago but they're told I'm told that Charles Finney and some of these evangelists from the 1700s would speak in a field full of people and they could be heard a mile away. How'd they do that? We can't be heard 50 feet away. We need the enablement of the sound system that's plugged in to the power supply. So it's B being enabled and, and it's passive. It's not telling you to do something. It's telling you to let something be done to you. Be enabled. David, he's surrounded by enemies. He needs to be enabled. He says, God gave me the strength to bend a bow of bronze. Like, man, if you could have a bow an arrow with a bronze bow. Can you imagine the power? If you could bend that thing back, man, that arrow would go through anything, right? That's a bazooka. That's a big gun. God enabled me. Do we realize that we even need to be enabled? Or do we think we're quite able on our own? Thank you. I've got counselors and I've got self-help books and I've got, you know, I've got my AA and NA and SA and whatever other A you need. We've got all this help. Do I really need the enablement of the Lord? And Paul says, finally, if you, if you ever get to the end of your rope, you're not at the end of power because now when you finally can give up on yourself, you can be enabled. God will do something in you which will give you the ability to get through things that you can't get through. Be enabled in the power of his might. It's interesting, there are four basic words in the Greek for power or strength or might, and three of them are in this verse. It's like be energized, be enabled in the Lord by the power, the oomph, kind of that, that word has to do with the the active output of the power of his strength, that great reservoir of power that God has. He can bring a pipe of that down and put the oomph out of that that enables you 
in ways that can't enable you until you give up. Be enabled in the Lord. When I was a kid, back in the 1960s, I remember my grandma Vinden, my dad's mom, she liked to listen to a radio program. This is back when TV was still black and white and a lot of the, where she lived out in the boonies, you didn't get TV. And if you had one, but she liked to listen to the radio and there was a program on the radio called Hawaii Calls. Anybody heard of that? It was a half an hour of a little bit of narration, but it was Hawaiian music and you can just hear the ukuleles and the slide guitar and, and you know, listening to that, you could, you could just see the palm trees swaying, even though it was the middle of winter in Wisconsin, you know, or whatever. You could see the, you could feel the ocean breeze and see the sunset and hear the music. And I don't know if you were like me, but I could just see the hula dancers <laughs> and their grass skirts telling the story with their hands and their hips, you know. You can just see this going on by listening to this music, Hawaii Calls. And you know, as a little kid, I just wanted to go to Hawaii really, really bad. My grandma had a lady friend that was from Hawaii, and back in the early 1950s, she got to go to Hawaii, and that was like, you realize it costs about as much to fly to Hawaii then as it does now? Several hundred dollars, except back then that would be the same as several thousand dollars. My grandma lives out in a cabin in the woods all of her life, but somehow she got to go to Hawaii. She talked about that the rest of her life. I just wanted to go to Hawaii. So if you want to go to Hawaii, what do you do? Well, if you don't have any money, you go down to the beach and you wade in the water and you start to swim, right? How far are you going to get? Uh, that's not going to work. You can give it all the ability you have, and you won't have a prayer of getting even close to Hawaii. Well, you can go down, you can flap your arms, right? Try to fly to Hawaii. It's not going to work. How do you get to Hawaii? You have to be enabled. You have to give up trying to get to Hawaii and let somebody else take you there. You have to trust a big machine with wings and engines and some guy called a pilot who supposedly says he knows how to fly it. And you have to just climb on board, sit back and trust that in the power of the strength of that airplane, you'll be enabled to Hawaii. Does that make sense? And that's what I see in this verse. I believe something that God does for all of us is he puts in us an inexpressible craving for something we don't have. Everybody's looking for more. I've heard some people say everybody's looking for God. The drunk in the gutter is looking for God. The person taking drugs is looking for God. The person involved in just sexual licentiousness is looking for God. The person trying to make a ton of money or get in, become the president or you know, in power is just looking for God. We're looking for more, something to fill up that hole in our lives, that hole that was opened up the moment we disconnected at the tree. When we told God to go away, we'll do it ourselves. We'll find our own way to nirvana. We'll find our own way to a higher heaven than the one you gave us, a better Eden. It opened up a hole. Remember we talked about it immediately. Shame and fear and then blame because it's not working. And I believe God allows us to feel that desire for something. We don't even know what it is. And we try to fill it with all kinds of things that get us addicted and sick and mess up our lives. like we're trying to swim to Hawaii. And we keep going to a different beach. 
Have you noticed that? We try swimming off of one beach, you know, Southern California. Well, that's not working, so we try, you know, go down to Guatemala or whatever and swim off of that beach. We, as if we're going to find the beach that we can swim to Hawaii. We keep trying the same thing in a different location. We keep getting addicted to something else and messed up by something else. And all the time, God is saying, I can enable it. But you got to get out of the water and stop swimming and let get on my plane and I can take you there. I have the power and the might to enable you to arrive at what your heart desires if you're willing to let me take you there. Sit back, relax in me, trust in me. David kept saying, I will trust in the God who is my strength. I believe that God lets us feel a need and then he's trying to speak into our lives the story that there is something better. The story of the gospel, the story of Jesus, the story of salvation. This is what you really need. This is the airplane that will get you to Hawaii and the only way there. But we keep trying another beach. We keep trying to swim through some more waves. We get on a surfboard, maybe that'll get us there, right? Float us. We keep trying, and God keeps saying, let me enable it. But it's a matter of trust. We have to stop trusting ourselves, which is what we started doing at the tree, and start trusting someone else. Who am I going to trust to enable me? A counselor? Somebody with a lot of money? Somebody with a lot of power? Or am I finally going to recognize that there's only one way to get where I want to go? And that is by trusting Jesus. That is by reestablishing the connection we lost at the tree. Be enabled in the Lord in the power of his might. You know, I think one of the greatest areas that we long for as human beings that eludes us the most is we simply long for love. We want to be loved and love. We long for long-term intimacy. And have you noticed we are really good at torpedoing our deepest relationships? I've run into a whole generation now that just says it's not going to happen. You know, in a week and a half, Marilyn and I will have been married 41 years. How in the world did that happen? Okay. Well, where'd the time go? But I can tell you something. It's only the enabling of the Lord that has allowed us to remain a couple to grow old together. We want to fill our hearts. We want love. We want to find love. We want to find intimacy. We want to find depth of relationship. We have a desire for that. It's because we're made in the image of God and God is love. And we keep trying another beach and we keep trying to swim to that intimacy. Maybe if I have enough friends, but no, we still go home alone at night. If I have more stuff, nope, that doesn't work. If I can just have some more drinking and dancing, you know, some more partying. If I can just have more sex, and all we end up having is momentary events that leave us more broken than before. It's like going after a mirage. Every time it gets close, it fades away. Inability to create true community. We are in a world filled with fake community. I'm sorry, I don't know if you haven't figured this out yet, but Facebook is not community. It's a fake. It's online, it's not in person. And I believe that that is the one area above all others that God wants to enable you and me. He wants to enable us 
to find love. To find it in him and find it in each other. What are the two great commandments? Love and love. Love with God, love with others. That's real community. That's intimacy. That's what God wants to give us. And I guess the appeal that I want to make is a little bit similar to what Marilyn made earlier, and that is there's only one way you're going to get to the Hawaii of intimacy, where the warm winds blow and the palm trees sway and the hula dancers are telling the story with their hands. And that is if you stop trying to find it yourself, God says, I can come in. I can bring love into your life. I can actually make you capable of loving others and them loving you. And I believe God wants to enable us through the power of his might to have the deepest desires of our heart even in the midst of a broken world. Now, here it'll never be all it's supposed to be, but it can be a whole lot more than anybody else can get. He can get you to the Hawaii. Nobody else can. The drugs and the sex and the booze and the dancing and the, you know, the, the nirvana that we try to, partying that we try to find or the, or the stuff or the, the power that we think is gonna make us finally be okay drops us in the middle of the ocean to sink, never gets us there. But you can't be enabled until you recognize you're disabled. And stop trying to work on your own ability and say, okay, finally. You know, God gives us a desire for something better. He then tries to speak into our lives where we can find it, that message of the gospel. And he gives us a conviction, I, I really want it. But until we come to that realization that we are helpless to achieve it on our own, how many times are we gonna sink just off the beach before we finally figure out we're not gonna be able to get to Hawaii by swimming? And when we finally give up and get on the plane and let somebody else enable it, and we'll get there. I believe that's true. Let's pray. Jesus, We need your strength. We need your enabling. But we are so loath to give up on our own attempts to get there ourselves. We've tried so many things over and over and over. May we give up on ourselves and recognize that we're going to just have to give on, get on your plane and let you pilot us there by your strength by your power, on your wings, you can enable us to find what we've always been looking for. Inner peace, intimacy, companionship, strength, security, the overcoming of our inferiority and insecurities when we know that we are safe in you, God, the rock, the strength, of our salvation, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.